Uh, good evening and welcome to the 311th meeting of the New York Comics and Picture Story Symposium. This is a weekly lecture series on comics, illustration, animation, and the history of text image work of all kinds. The series is sponsored in part by the Will and Ann Eisner Family Foundation. Our guest tonight is Richard Samuel West. He's the author of a number of books on American cartooning, including Satire on Stone about Joseph Kepler, Iconoclast in Ink, The Political Cartoons of J.N. Ding Darling, uh, The San Francisco Wasp, an Illustrated History, and other books. His latest book in collaboration with Michael Alexander Kahn is What Fools These Mortals Be? The Story of Puck. Uh, that's the American Humor magazine founded in 1871 by the Austrian-born cartoonist Joseph Kepler. Richard is also the owner of Periodicy, a business that trades in significant and unusual 19th century American paper. His talk tonight is entitled My Life in Cartoons, and here's uh, Richard. Thanks, Ben. It's an honor to be included in your distinguished lineup of speakers. I was inducted into the cult of comic art by Charles Schultz's Peanuts. Like many kids in the 1960s, I found myself swept up in the Peanuts mania that included the daily strip, book collections, TV specials, a Broadway musical, and just the beginning of a licensing tsunami like the world had never seen. I didn't know why I liked Peanuts. I certainly didn't analyze my attraction to it. But looking back now, I assume, like a lot of kids, I identified with Charlie Brown. And I was both charmed and bewildered by Snoopy and his vivid fantasy life. I was enough of a fan of the strip to, to write, not once, but twice to Charles Schultz, who, true gentleman that he was, responded kindly both times. But like most adolescent infatuations, my Peanuts phase did not last long. In 1968, I got caught up in presidential politics and began collecting political campaign memorabilia. Though my interest in that hobby lasted more than a half dozen years, it eroded slowly but inexorably when in 1970, I stumbled across one, itch, one issue each of Puck and Judge at, of all places, a yard sale. I marveled at these American magazines, full color political cartoons from the turn of the century. As I was becoming disenchanted with the soaring prices for tiny campaign buttons, I was wowed by the aesthetic value of these bold and beautiful cartoons. Very few other people shared my interest I was able to purchase volume upon volume of both magazines for something like $25 a half year, which figured out to be about a dollar an issue. This struck me at the time and does even more so today as a great bargain. When I began searching for information on the magazines, I was surprised by how little had been written about them. There were two able chapters in Frank Luther Mott's A History of American Magazines and an appreciative section on magazines in Hessen Kaplan's History of American Political Cartooning, The Ungentlemanly Art. But that was about all. So I determined sometime in 1971 to redress that by writing histories of the magazines myself. I can't calculate the amount of time and money I spent from 71 to 78 fulfilling that promise to myself. Trips to New York City, trips to DC, days upon days spent in libraries, pouring through the magazines themselves, through reference books, through reels of microfilm. 
I was well, well advanced on my Puck and Judge project when I entered Kenyon College in 1973. I was given a pass on the American history intro course that most freshmen were required to take and enrolled in an upper class course on, I think, American labor history. There I met Jim Borkman, a sophomore from Cincinnati. I liked him immediately, remembered studying for a few exams with him and only a bit later learning that he too had an interest in cartooning. Jim was such a fan of Oliphant and Mignelli that he assiduously clipped their political cartoons and pasted them into scrapbooks that he had made to collect their work. He also subscribed to the New York Review of Books just to marvel at David Levine's caricatures. At the time, I was only vaguely aware of modern political cartoons. I remember seeing Tony Auth's work in my hometown newspaper, the Philadelphia Inquirer, and Oliphant's mascot, Punch, sorry, <laughs> Oliphant's mascot, Punk, had lodged somewhere in my memory, but until I met Jim, I had paid no attention to the modern practitioners of the art. I was firmly stuck in the 19th century. My sophomore year at Kenyon coincided with the college's 150th anniversary. Jim and I teamed up for a series of illustrated articles that appeared in the Kenyon Collegian on Kenyon's famous alumni. So while I dutifully recounted incidents in the lives of students such as Rutherford B. Hayes and Paul Newman, Jim drew them in caricature. It was during Jim's junior year that he began to think seriously about a career in cartooning. He was an art major at Kenyon and the art faculty there was supportive of narrative art. During the summer following the famous alumni series, Jim sent samples of his work to David Levine, asking for criticism and advice. To Jim's delight, Levine wrote back an encouraging letter. This may have been the impetus that prompted Jim to volunteer to draw a weekly political cartoon for the Kenyan Collegian during his senior year. In any event, I remember being surprised by the news. As soon as Jim got into the rhythm of a weekly cartoon, we started scheming about his future. I had become friends with Jerry Doyle, the retired political cartoonist for the Philadelphia Record and the Philadelphia Daily News. He had been a mentor to and was still friends with L.D. Warren, the retired cartoonist for the Cincinnati Inquirer. I convinced Jim to let me send a portfolio of his cartoons to Jerry, who would in turn send that portfolio with praise, we hope, to L.D. Warren, who would in turn suggest to the Inquirer Brass that they might want to take a serious look at the young man's work. In the meantime, Jim's father, a commercial painter in Cincinnati, knew in some informal way the editor of the Inquirer Sunday Magazine. He got a copy of Jim's portfolio to him. The stars aligned in December when L.D. visited the Inquirer offices with Jim's portfolio under, under his arm only to be accosted in the hallway by the Sunday Magazine editor who wanted to show him something. Wonder of wonders, the identical portfolio of Jim's work that Jim's father had given him. A few interviews later, Jim was anointed political cartoonist for the Cincinnati Inquirer to be in New York soon after graduation. Jim and I were agog with excitement and disbelief. A lot of his classmates were too. We weren't used to the idea of someone we knew actually earning a living, but it looked as if Jim had pulled off that feat with flying colors. As a lover of the political cartoon, I felt unbelievably fortunate to be on the ground floor of Jim's career. For the first 10 years or so of his time at the Inquirer, he sent me copies of every cartoon he drew, and I sent back comments and criticism. I thought Jim's outsized talent would take the world by storm, and like McNelly and Auth before him, he would be recognized with a Pulitzer within a few years. It took a bit longer than that, 15 years to be exact, but the world did eventually notice, and Jim has won just about every prize that a cartoonist can win. How could my senior year compare to the heady days of the year before as I watched Jim's steady ascent? That question was answered the first week of school when a freshman, knocked on my dorm door to learn more about Jim Borgman and how he had gone from lowly Kenyan student to a professional cartoonist in lightning speed. 
That freshman was Bill Watterson. My status as a friend of Jim's elevated me in Bill's eyes as someone who might have wisdom to impart. For my part, I didn't know what to make of Bill until I saw his first cartoon in the Collegian. It was not amazing on an empirical level, but I, expecting so little, thought it was great. Funny, relevant, and fluidly drawn. I remember hunting Bill down that very moment in the school cafeteria to tell him how much I liked it. He seemed a bit bewildered by my enthusiasm. He's always been modest about his abilities. But I think that was the day our friendship was born. Bill struck me as a true raw talent. He had the desire to draw cartoons and Jim's old spot on the Collegian had become his for the asking. But Bill felt unprepared to identify himself as a political cartoonist. So I agreed to assist. We met every Monday or Tuesday evening to brainstorm a political cartoon idea that he could use for his weekly cartoon. I remember enjoying these sessions, cracking each other up by staging action and mugging faces, but the cartoons that were resulted were generally lame. Either it's a bad idea to develop cartoons by committee, or we simply didn't make a good team. Our partnership in any case lasted longer than it should have. When Bill started working on his own, I think his cartoons became stronger, more an authentic expression of who he was. I continued in my role as critic throughout my senior year and then continued to review his work by letter for the next decade, but Bill was off and running. Lightning had struck twice. I had the pleasure of watching his genius unfold. After graduating from Kenyon in 1977, I moved back home to finish my book on Puck and Judge and think about my future. In the meantime, I embarked in a feverish postal service correspondence with Jim and Bill. It wasn't uncommon for us to write to one another weekly, me from my desk in my home in Pennsylvania, Jim from his drawing table at the Inquirer, and Bill from his dorm room at Kenyon. <clears throat> what a fine time it was, full of promise for the three of us. As much as we fantasized about future achievements, none of us dreamed that Jim and Bill would scale the heights of success to the extent that they have. <clears throat> Much of the content of our letters was given over to cartoon talk. I, the more I read and learned about cartoon history, and the more I voiced my opinions about contemporary cartooning in private correspondence, I began to envision a forum, a publication of sorts, to go public with my growing obsession. This led me to launch the Puck Papers, a newsletter devoted to political cartooning in the fall of 1978. The lead article was a profile of Philadelphia's own H.L. Stevens, a Civil War era cartoonist and children's book illustrator. But that wasn't what garnered attention within the profession. In my review of Charles Brooks' best editorial cartoons of 1978, I led off with a quote by Gerald Johnson, who proclaimed 20 years earlier that the majority of cartoonists were stupid and lazy men. Unfortunately, the Brooks series went a long way toward proving Johnson's assertion. Year after year, it was full of mediocre cartoons. About this time, I was approached for advice by Richard Freeman, a retired professor at the University of Kentucky, who was working on an anthology of political cartoons. I quickly saw his anthology as an answer to Brooks series one that would feature only the best cartoons. The arrogance of youth prompted me to offer to publish it, the first, and it would turn out only book to be issued by the Puck Press. The saga of the best political cartoons of 1978 could constitute its own lengthy talk. Suffice it to say, I twisted Watterson's arm to draw a cover that neither of us was proud of. I miscommunicated with my printer resulting in a costly and irreversible error. I pissed off at least two cartoonists who wrote me obscenity-laced or sarcastic letters. And because the book sold per poorly, I lost most of the costs of production. On the other hand, the Puck Papers was proving to be great fun. I published it in the stone age of self-publishing, which meant I typed out the copy over and over again on a typewriter brought cartoons to my printer to have them reduced in size, 
and pasted the elements together on stiff cardboard to prepare the pages for printing. I wrote most of the newsletter myself, but Watterson helped out with art and an occasional book review. The Puck Paper's peak circulation was, I think, 65 subscribers. It proved of little consequence to the profession, but for me, it meant a lot. First, it provided me with a forum in the field of political cartooning to parallel Jim's work at the Enquirer and Bill's at the Collegian, in a way to stay in the mix and remain relevant to their worlds. Second, it brought my interest to the attention of Ken Mattern, a history teacher at a private school in suburban Philadelphia. He too was interested in the history of political cartooning and we quickly became friends. I talked to him about my vision of turning the Puck Papers into a magazine. He made it possible by volunteering his help. Target, the political cartoon quarterly, was first published in the autumn of 81. The issue was graced with a fine cover by Watterson, a long interview with Don Wright of the Miami News, who was something of an enigma among modern cartoonists, and a portfolio of the work of a completely unknown cartoonist working in Buffalo, Tom Tolles. Accolades, and more importantly to me, subscriptions trickled in. Soon the magazine staff was joined by Kevin Callagher, the cartoonist for The Economist in London, who became our British correspondent. And first David Rosen, and later Steve Bradley, who kept us abreast of Canadian cartooning. And in their spare time, ed edited the best political cartoons of Canada series. Though I incurred all costs, Ken served as a valuable backup, sharing writing chores and performing some of the less glamorous office work. Meanwhile, Bill and Jim, had through my agency become friends and begun a correspondence of their own. Naturally, Jim became something of a mentor to Bill and Bill his acolyte. It wasn't entirely a coincidence then that Bill in his senior year at Kenyon was called on by the Cincinnati Post. After all, what had worked for the Cincinnati Enquirer might work for them as well. In any event, in the summer of 1980, history repeated itself and Bill, fresh out of Kenyon, found himself at the drawing board of the Post, just across town from Jim and his office in the Enquirer building. It was a weird turn of events for both of them. Bill was daunted to be even in nominal competition with his mentor, and Jim was unnerved to find someone he encouraged breathing down his neck. For my part, I found myself feeling the stress of a three-way friendship that had previously worked fine when we all and it inhabited our own worlds. Bill's tenure at the Post proved to be brutally short. It became clear that Bill did not enjoy the confidence of his editor. He shot down lots of Bill's roughs and made each day a marathon of endurance. Watterson's cartoons in the Post were supposed to be appearing daily. During some weeks, he was lucky if they appeared once. This rocked his confidence, which hadn't begun that high in the first place, and virtually guaranteed his eventual dismissal, which came at the end of his three-month probationary period. The experience had been life-draining for Bill. Eventually, he headed home to Northern Ohio and turned his attention to developing a comic strip. Target was becoming many things I had hoped. Cartoonists seemed to perceive it as an important voice, they both wanted to be interviewed and yet didn't entirely look forward to it, which suggested to me that we were hitting the right mark of probing but not assaulting our subjects. Our big book reviews were taken seriously. One cartoonist who received a less than complimentary review entered into a discussion with me by mail that turned into a tutorial of sorts. In the end, he said he had never received better advice from anyone, especially not as editors. This pleased me a great deal. I wanted Target to celebrate the profession while encouraging higher standards. Of course, we didn't make everyone happy. Twice we were threatened by lawsuits, neither of which came to fruition. And more than a few cartoonists were peeved by my obvious preference for the Oliphant McNelly School that Jim had introduced me to 10 years earlier. I had great respect for Herblock, Malden, Conrad and their colleagues but I didn't love their work the way I loved the younger crowds. Another pleasure of publishing Target was the opportunity it afforded me to promote Bill's talents. He was always happy to lend a hand. 
He drew a third of our covers and wrote several thoughtful essays and reviews. Jim called him during this period the best unknown cartoonist in America. It was a prescient label, as events soon would bear out. Life flew by. Jim got married to his college sweetheart back in 78. When their first child, Dylan, was born in 82, they honored me by asking me to be his godfather. That same year, Bill and his high school girlfriend, Melissa, got married. Bill, Jim, and I had our first reunion since college days at Bill's wedding. It was at this event when Jim and I found ourselves on a very short guest list that we came to realize how important we were in Bill's life. I was working as an editor and writer at a medical publishing house in suburban Philadelphia. It was a dynamic, successful company, and I was happy there for a while. In 1982, I decided to write a biographical sketch of Joseph Kepler for Target based on my college era book on Puck and Judge that had never moved further than my desk drawer. As I got deeper and deeper into the task and the manuscript grew, I came to realize that I was writing a book. It took me several years to complete what would become Satire on Stone when the political cartoons of Joseph Kepler. I still get pleasure perusing the book, despite having learned things in the last 30 years that I wish I could have added to the narrative and my disappointment in having most of the cartoons reproduced in black and white. Meanwhile, Jim's reputation as a political cartoonist was growing. He had proven to be less compliant than Inquirer editors had expected, but because they valued his services, they gave him, gave him the freedom he desired. He was now widely viewed as an independent voice on a conservative newspaper and by fellow Cincinnatians as a local icon. Bill was slaving away at a petty job on a penny saver type weekly, drawing uh, a weekly cartoon for a chain of suburban Cleveland newspapers and is in his spare time submitting stripped ideas to syndicates. Bill sent me every portfolio he sent to syndicates, so I had the opportunity to see his comic strip vision develop. Every one of his strips was nicely drawn and contained Bill's characteristic surprising touches of humor, but none of them really worked. Fernbusterville, which had more characters than one could count, was the best, mainly because the main character had a smart talking little brother with a toy tiger who was always stealing the show. United Features was the only syndicate to respond to Bill's work with something other than a standard rejection letter. With their encouragement, he began to develop which would become Calvin and Hobbes. Then in 1984, USNF pulled one of the strangest moves in syndication history. They invited Bill to New York to pitch him on the idea of incorporating a new character they had licensed. Robot Man into Calvin and Hobbes. Bill was bewildered and upset by the pro pro Bill was bewildered and upset by the proposal and firmly declined. With United Features out of the running and the Washington Post Syndicate taking a pass, Universal Press Syndicate, with its track record of innovation, was now the only obvious home for Calvin and Hobbes. So sometime in '84. Bill redirected his rejected portfolio to UPS. It was an exciting day for me in November 1985 when Calvin and Hobbes had its debut. My memory is that my hometown newspaper, The Inquirer, was an early client. In any event, Lee Salem at Universal did me the courtesy of sending me press proofs of the dailies at the same time they were sent out to newspapers. The strip was not an immediate hit, but quickly became one after the first Calvin and Hobbes book was published in the spring of 1987. It had a first printing of 50,000 copies and would eventually sell several million. The book's success prompted newspapers to clamor for the strip. Everyone involved, Bill, the syndicate, and me as a bystander was floored by the huge success of Calvin and Hobbes. Bill had found his voice. In the meantime, Target rolled on. I recall several highlights. One was interviewing the stars of the political cartoon world. Oliphant, McNelly, Herblock, Peters, Malden, Marlette, Off, Sargent, and a number of others. 
Most of the interviews were conducted over the phone, but our longest interview, a two-parter with Oliphant, was conducted one afternoon in a bar in Washington, D.C. As I recall, Oliphant was the only subject who made it a stipulation of his cooperation that he get to edit the final interview. Edit he did. I told him later, to his delight, that he had changed his answers just enough to some of my more probing questions that he came off looking forthright and me dim-witted. In 1985, I moved to Washington, D.C. to pursue a career in political advocacy. Target came with me. It wasn't long, however, before the staff began to fray. Ken Mattern was tired of the routine, and Cal resigned as British editor to move to the U.S. and become the editorial cartoonist for the Baltimore Sun. I decided Target's time was done. During the same time that I was working on Kepler, I was invited by Tony Auth to help him compile his second collection of cartoons. It led to many happy hours working together at Tony's townhouse in Philly and his beach house in New Jersey. As editor, I reviewed all of Tony's work from the last 10 years, made an initial cut, then we cut more together, then I arranged the winning cartoons into a narrative and wrote the captions. By a pleasant coincidence, Tony's collection, Lost in Space, The Reagan Years, and my book, Satire on Stone, were published nearly the same month in 1988. We celebrated in a joint signing event at Politics and Prose, a local landmark bookshop in Washington, D.C., graced by a surprise visit from Pat Oliphant. Soon after, I had the pleasure of working with Kevin Callagher on his first collection of cartoons from the Baltimore Sun. The same year, I assisted Sidney Wilkinson produce a collection of pro-choice cartoons. Throughout this time, I was developing a professional and personal friendship with Lucy Caswell at the Ohio State University Cartoon Art Library, now the Billy Ireland Cartoon Museum and Museum. I had long admired Lucy's diligence as a curator, establishing a, visit, vis, a vision of the library built on Milt Kniff's bequest that was comprehensive in scope and scholarly in intent. No other library in the country shared those goals. For the past 40 years, I have done everything in my power to further the mission of the OSU library. In 2012, it moved into impressive new quarters and renamed itself the Billy Ireland Cartoon Library and Museum. It will stand for generations as a testament to Lucy's unfaltering vision and to an and to its enduring importance to cartoon art. For four years in the mid 90s, I served as political cartoon editor of Inks, OSU's tri-quarterly publication devoted to the study of cartoon art. The magazine wasn't all that I hoped it would be. Some of the contributions seemed to me to exemplify the worst in academic studies, full of jargon, empty of significance. But we did publish some good history valuable interviews and strong book reviews. I was sorry to see it fold for financial reasons after four years. By this time, Jim had won his Pulitzer and a Reuben or two, and Bill was at the top of his game with Calvin and Hobbes. My impressions from afar were that Jim had finally found some peace as a cartoonist, comfortable with his level of achievement and recognition. Bill was in a different place. Since the late 80s, the pressure to license his characters had become constant. Initially, he had been open to a few of the standard products. That's why two wall calendars were produced. But eventually, he came to view licensing as a slippery slope, and he told UPS to stop bothering him with proposals. You can imagine how frustrating this was to the syndicate. Lee Salem once told me that they would have had to double the size of their company if Bill had green-lighted every proposal that had come their way. At first, being a Peanuts alumnus, I didn't understand Bill's inflexibility on the matter. I had seen a clever stuffed toy that could change from one animal to another simply by unzipping the animal's stomach and flipping it inside out. I thought this design would be perfect for a real slash stuffed Hobbs. But Bill was not so thrilled by the idea of disgorging millions of Hobbs dolls into the world let alone movies, TV specials, coffee cups, greeting cards, napkins, etc. 
I soon came to accept his stand and would come to his defense whenever the issue came up. Looking back, he made the right decision. In the early 90s, I started a family and then a business, Periodicy. My decision to leave politics allowed me to envision a new life somewhere other than DC. My wife and I picked Northampton, Massachusetts and moved there in 1995. It proved to be a great quote, great choice. After many years of writing sporadically, I turned my energies once again to cartoon history in 2002, when I acquired a large quantity of issues of the San Francisco Wasp, the West Coast's answer to Puck and Judge. Once again, in looking for information on the magazine, I was startled to find virtually nothing had been written. In 2004, under the name Periodicy Press, I published the San Francisco Wasp, an illustrated history. It was a challenge to research and shape into a co coherent story, but I'm proud of the book that resulted, particularly the color plates. Two years later, I was approached by a British scholar, Jenny Brown, who was interested in learning more about an American, the American career of a Victorian cartoonist named William Newman. Practically nothing was known about Newman, not even birth and death dates. Jenny and I soon determined to write that. I published our joint effort, William Newman, a Victorian cartoonist in London and New York in 2008. In 2010, OSU Press approached me to ask if I had written anything that they might publish. 20 years earlier, I, I had started a, bar, a work on a biography of J.N. Ding Darling of the Des Moines Register, but I had never finished it. This proved to be the impetus I needed to complete it. In 2012, the Cartoon Museum published Iconoclast and in Ink, the political cartoons of J.N. Ding Darling. Almost immediately after that book came out, I was approached by a friend and fellow collector, Mike Kahn, who asked me for my assistance in writing a book on Puck Magazine. I immediately saw this as an opportunity to tell the whole story about Puck, not just Kepler's role in the magazine, and availing ourselves of new digital printing technology to reproduce the cartoons in color. Designer editor Dean Mullaney of IDW Publishing embraced the project and help us to produce in 2014, the most beautiful book I had ever been associated with. What Fools These Mortals Be, The Story of Puck. The book sold out quickly and is now only available at stupidly high prices in the used book market. Today, I'm deeply into a biography of Frank Ballou, America's leading cartoonist before the emergence of NAST. I suspect this will be my final project. It's hard to believe that it has been 26 years since Calvin and Hobbes sailed down their last snow-covered landscape, but what Bill created will be with us always, thanks especially to the beautiful, complete Calvin and Hobbes that came out 15 years ago. Jim had been awed by Bill's achievement, and though he had tinkered with comic strip ideas over the years, I think he was always a bit daunted about stepping into what had become Bill's arena. That situation changed, of course, in 1995 when Bill retired. The stars aligned, Jim met Jerry Scott, and Zitz was born in 1997. It is, I believe, as in as many papers today as Calvin and Hobbes was at its zenith. As good a political cartoonist as Jim was, and I think he was great, he was and is not a political animal by nature. When he walked away from the Inquirer job after 32 years in 2008, he didn't miss it for a minute. The world of zits suits him just fine. I still see Jim and Bill as frequently as possible. They are my two oldest friends. My gratitude to them for providing me with a front row seat to their remarkable careers is only exceeded by my affection and regard. Thanks for listening. Thank you. If you have a, um, a question for Rich, put your name in the chat and I'll unmute you. And we can have a, everyone is applauding with these little hands. Uh, any questions?
Hmm. Oops, Michael has a question. Okay, go ahead, Michael. Okay. Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, and uh, thank you for the uh, trip through your uh, comics life. And I was, I would like you, if you could, please to say, talk more about the um, the scene at the time that that uh, uh, Puck and Wasp uh, was going on, and in terms of maybe politics in general, but also the kind of uh, racial images that they were dealing with at that time. Yeah. Well, thank you. The Wasp. I'm. Can you unmute mute me, Ben? Oh, sorry. Did I do that? Wait, hold on. Yeah, I can. No, hear. I we hear you. Oh, okay. Um, uh, as you could see from the wasp cartoon that I showed, it uh, had a Statue of Liberty uh, that uh, was replaced with a uh, savage caricature of a. Chinese immigrant with rats at his feet and uh, uh, you know the implication of the destruction of modern culture as we know it. Um, the racism in these magazines is profound. Um, it to me it's a great object lesson uh, that we should never whitewash, we should never overlook that um, this, um, the virulence of the racism, I think suggests how deep in our DNA uh, the issue of, of bigotry and prejudice is. Uh, the magazines at their height were, at a time in American history where immigration was at its height. So we saw uh, in the 1870s when Puck began, there was uh, beginning immigration from Southern Europe. So uh, prior to that, we had um, you know, the Irish, of course, in the 40s and the Germans, but uh, then we started getting uh, Italians, uh, Greek, uh, people from the Mediterranean, uh, Blacks were beginning to move north. Uh, the Chinese had been imported to do uh, manual labor in California, and they weren't inclined to go back until they had enough money uh, to support their families there. And the, uh, the fear of the American working class and also the fear of the uh, Anglo-Saxon wasps uh, was uh, pronounced. And so one of the ways it was expressed, uh, well, two ways it was expressed was in these virulent political cartoons, but then also it was supported by these comic images that were all supposed to be in good fun. And when uh, Jews protested to Puck about their caricatures of them as uh, sly or unethical businessmen, uh, they would say, can't you take a joke? And when mm -hmm. the Irish and the Catholic protested to Puck, they said, can't you take a joke? And uh, the Wasp never apologized uh, for its um, uh, anti uh, Chinese cartoons, and they persisted for 20 years. It didn't matter, even after 1882, when exclusion laws were passed in Washington that prevented immigration from China, they still beat the drum. And they said that the immigration laws were too weak and that people were still coming in, even though there was no evidence that uh, the Chinese population was increasing. So, uh, you know, a lot of people look with shame on these cartoons. Uh, I think they need to be seen in context 
but I also think they are extraordinary educational tools to help people not only reflect on our past, but perhaps take this as an opportunity to look at how we picture people today and think to ourselves, will people be looking back in a hundred years on us and say, oh my God, what were they thinking? So uh, it's, a, uh, it's a very reflective act to look at these uh, images. And I think it would be a shame if uh, the left and the right uh, prevented them from uh, being circulated in context because they teach us valuable lessons. Yeah, you can even look at them now and say, what were they thinking in terms of the whole immigration situation that's been ginning up for the, for the past five years? And WASP, the, the anti-Chinese stamps, that was really part of their mission statement, wasn't it? Absolutely, yep. yeah. It was, yeah. Uh, it was central uh, to the magazine's uh, editorial position. Uh, a judge in the beginning was very anti-Semitic, but that toned down quickly when new owners moved in. Uh, Puck uh, was sort of an equal opportunity ridiculer, but their political cartoons tended to be much more sensitive to issues of uh, bigotry and prejudice. They had cartoons uh, decrying the treatment of American Indians. Uh, they had uh, cartoons uh, decrying uh, lynching. Um, but on the other hand, the center pages, the interior pages were still filled with uh, gross caricatures of blacks stealing chickens and eating watermelon and uh, the Irish being uh, brutish and uh, bomb throwing and et cetera, et cetera. So whatever enlightenment they showed politically was uh, seriously undercut by their contents. Oddly, Life magazine, the comic life, uh, began uh, kind of as a, was a very gentle satirist until after the turn of the century when uh, they rebelled against what they perceived as the Jewish domination of the American theater. And uh, in 1903, 04, 05, they had some of the most anti-Semitic cartoons that had ever appeared in any of the magazines. Uh, again, that phase passed, but um, it's, uh, it demands more study. Uh, there's, there's so much there that reveals so much about us that uh, has hardly gotten the attention that it deserves. Mm. Could I ask one more quick uh, follow-up uh, question that, of a personal nature, and then I'll uh, stop, is that I was wondering if you could talk, like, in particular, what was it, if you could kind of go through your, your personal uh, attraction to an involvement uh, with uh, Puck. I, I just love What Fools, by the way. Your, that book is so stunning. It's great. Um, Thank you. Yeah, so, yeah, if you could... Talk about your 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 love for Buck and how it how it started and grew. Well, you know, I think uh, I was reflecting. You know, I I do believe that Peanuts introduced me to graphic humor, and uh, that uh, acclimated me to looking at cartoons and appreciating them as a form of art. When I saw when I became interested in politics, and then I saw these glorious full color political cartoons, most of which made no sense to me because I had no context for understanding them. Uh, I was, the aesthetics of it just immediately drew me in. I, I couldn't believe how pretty they were. And I was rather desperate to understand their context. Um, so, you know, I think the uh, one of the uh, tragedies of Puck and Judge, for the most part, is that they thrived uh, between the Civil War and World War One, and certainly they thrived in the last quarter of the 19th century, which was among the most boring 
uh, well, in one sense, the most boring political period because the big fights were about the tariff and uh, uh, issues that, though they're still relevant today, you know, free trade and protection are just, you know, hit the snooze button. Uh, the interesting things that they were at the forefront of was immigration and uh, uh, issues of equality. And then when TR came in, he was an exciting person. You know, no one can get very excited about Grover Cleveland these days or Benjamin <laughs> Harrison, but you, uh, people have enough knowledge about TR that when they see those cartoons, they say, these are neat. Uh, but I do think that if, if the technology had been such that Puck could have been published during the Civil War, so many more people would be would know the magazine and would be attracted to its contents because it would be speaking about uh, issues that you know are indelible in the history of our country. Um, the fact that you know they covered from Hayes to McKinley primarily was. Uh, you know, their misfortune. Okay. A question from Mike Road. Did you want to, would you like to ask that? Oops. Mike. Uh, is Mike Road there? No. Okay. Uh, I didn't know you properly. Uh, Rich, uh, you and I had uh, lunch with Richard Thompson a few years ago, and I was wondering if you could tell people here how you met Richard and uh, what you uh, thought of his uh, career and your friendship together. Thank yeah, you. Hi, Mike. Good to hear from you. Um, he's, it's true, he's someone I left out of my narrative mainly because even though I loved him and I loved his work, um, I never uh, played a central role in his life the way that I have with Bill and Jim. But I met Richard uh, 32, 33 years ago. Uh, and um, I was introduced by a mutual friend at a lunch in DC and he pulled out his portfolio and I am excruciatingly embarrassed to admit that I was underwhelmed. I thought uh, his work was derivative and uh, I didn't see the spark of genius. Um, my respect for him grew uh, as his work matured. I left DC in 95. So after that, even though like the time we had lunch together, when I'd come back to DC, I'd try to see Richard. Um, I wasn't as intimately connected with him as I had been when I lived there. Um, I remember getting his book, Richard's Poor Almanac, and somewhat like my reaction to Bill's early work, I was stunned by how fantastic it was. And it caught me by surprise. And I tried to think back, um, you know, what had I missed? Why didn't I see this genius? Because that's, that's, that's as good a book as it gets, it seems to me, in graphic humor. And so cul-de-sac, when he sent me that portfolio, he had asked my opinion about the strip uh, before it had been picked up by uh, Universal. I thought it was unique. And I immediately passed the uh, portfolio on to Bill Watterson, because I know Bill was kind of despairing about the quality of uh, uh, comic strips in the early 21st century. And he was blown away too. So that uh, was the entree for Bill and Richard to get to know each other. And that was, that was fruitful for both of them. You know, it pulled Bill Watterson a bit out of his shell. And uh, he came to DC many times to visit Richard. And um, uh, I think Richard really uh, loved, was really uh, bowled over by Bill's enthusiasm for his work. So then cul-de-sac came out and pretty much everyone who cared about comic strips came to see Richard for uh, 
the talent he was. And then you lay on the caricatures and the, uh, uh, the just extraordinary amount of work that he turned out. And uh, one time uh, before Richard died, Bill said to me, um, Richard's the greatest cartoonist of our time. And I was kind of taken aback by that. Um, but then he said to me, you know, who can do his range? Who can bring that talent to bear on so many different areas of uh, cartoon art? And I had to agree. Um, I couldn't think of anyone with his range of talent and his dedication and his, I mean, you know, his insanity when it came to uh, doing a drawing over and over again to get it right. I mean, it was kind of manic, but, you know, uh, that spurred his genius. That was part of the package. And, uh, you know, his early death was just a terrible loss uh, to me as a friend, feeling like I had, um, frankly, uh, failed him in his later years by not being in as close contact as I should have been, but being um, happy to know that guys like you and other uh cartoonists and fans in the DC area stood by him and uh, were so important to him in his later years. But thank you for bringing him up. He, uh, uh, it was, a, it was a, uh, an honor and a treasure having seen his creative arc. Okay, question from Josh Brown. Hi, Mike. I mean, I'm sorry. Hi, Rich. <laughs> Hi. Uh, I was curious if there had been any uh, sort of cross-fertilization uh, between your interests in uh, 19th century cartoonists, and early 20th century cartoonists, and, and your friends, or for that matter, uh, the many cartoonists you've talked to, about the, if they're um, being influenced by or, you know, expressed interest in the, their predecessors. Yeah. Uh, well, when Jim and I were in college, he was intrigued by the Puck cartoons. Um, I couldn't say he ever developed a, a uh, deep appreciation for them, but he did marvel at the, the richness of the graphic technique and uh, often how crowded the cartoons were and how <laughs> intricate they were. So from a, a standpoint of just appreciating it as art, uh, Jim was, um, you know, a fan. Um, I think, though, he's reflected several times that the world has changed so much in one sense. You know, Puck frequently alluded to Shakespeare or frequently alluded to the Bible. And Jim has said, if he did, if he used those types of analogies today, people would be scratching their heads from Maine to California, uh, there's no, uh, the only equivalent in the 80s and 90s when Jim was doing uh, most of his work was TV, you know, and music, this shared popular culture. Um, and that doesn't resonate, I think, the same way as uh, Shakespeare and the stories of the Bible. So he, I do think he felt a bit, um, that he had been a little cheated, uh, that his uh, uh, tools were not as uh, perhaps elegant as the cartoonists of the 19th century. Uh, Bill is, has an extraordinary depth of knowledge and appreciation for fine art. And uh, many times he will travel uh, partway across the country to go to museums just to view uh, five works that he's always wanted to see in person. Um, and he's talking about meeting me in Boston to do that again uh, this fall. Um, so he is uh, a, a real connoisseur of artistic technique. I don't think he's ever been able to get over the uh, 
inability to decipher the Puck and Judge cartoons. I don't think, uh, he doesn't have the frame of reference and I'm not uh, sure <laughs> uh, he cares to develop it. So um, in a sense, um, uh, my, uh, I would say my interest in Puck and Judge has far less influence on their work than uh, what I learned from Puck and Judge cartoons. And I could bring to criticizing the work that they did, understanding the layers of communication that a cartoonist uses in his best cartoons, why a cartoonist chose to approach a subject in a specific way, why he chose to arrange his characters in a specific way. These are lessons that uh, I believe any cartoonist can find a value. So I was able to apply some of my uh, deep looking, if you will, on the 19th century cartoonist work to Jim and Bill's work in their early days. And uh, I, sus I assume they appreciated it because we continued to do it uh, for years and years. And, uh, you know, I was, flattered that they wanted my attention and uh, they seem to uh, need uh, someone to look critically at their work. So it's been a nice symbiotic relationship, but I don't think there's a direct line uh, between Puck and Judge and uh, Bill and Jim's work. Neither of them speak German. Thanks. Thank you. Anybody else? Any other questions? Hi, this is Lana. Hi, Rich. Um, Hi, Lana. How are you? We, we have a group of us from high school uh, that have been listening to you tonight. And I wanted, I wanted to say that it is really exciting to see that your, uh, what we thought was just a massive obsession has become a real career. <laughs> and that you're not only a book writer about stuff, but you're also a, uh, I won't use, I'll use the word kingmaker, but, or at least a cartoon person enabler. So, uh, glad to see it. I remember sitting upstairs in your place and you're talking about this all the time. And I was like, what, what is this stuff? But I mean, you were into this forever and ever. And my question was, if you had been able to draw, would you probably have become a cartoonist yourself? I don't know if you do draw or not, but I was just. Um, that's a, uh, a very serious question that I've thought about because I have no facility to draw, I can't really imagine doing it. Uh, my Part of my fascination with Puck and Judge and then uh, Bill and Jim's and Richard Thompson's work was uh, seeing it explode on paper, seeing it, seeing them express themselves on paper uh, in a way that I couldn't. Uh, that, you know, any cartoonist who's watching tonight knows how thrilled people are when they do chalk talks and they show, they draw in front of their audience. Uh, uh, it's a, uh, it's a great talent. And for those of us who don't have it, uh, it's just so much fun to watch it uh, in flower. So I, I think I'd have to be a very different person to have uh, become a cartoonist. Um, I can say without a doubt that uh, Bill and Jim and uh, Richard's talents uh, were so extraordinary that if I had drawn, I probably would have quit very early on in the face of what they were able to do. 
So I think I found my path um, and it's, uh, it's been just a lot of fun for it's now 50 years. I think Mike has, Mike Road has a, another question or two. Uh, yeah, Rich. Uh, so I'm a professional archivist, and I was wondering if you were uh, planning to donate your papers and collection somewhere at some point, uh, perhaps to Ohio State. That's number one. Uh, uh, yes, uh, very much so. You know, I've, I've, I've always been bewildered by people who like to collect things and then uh, choose to disperse them because I see the act of collecting as trying to repair the damage that time does on things, the way it separates stuff that used to be together. And archivists and collectors uh, bring stuff back together, try to uh, create an order that was originally there so that we can better understand what we're looking at. So I've amassed a, a pretty uh, extensive collection of uh, American political cartoon art. And uh, some of it, I'm actually in the process of working with the American Antiquarian Society to fill in the holes in their extraordinary collection, but they cut off at 1876. Um, and I have been in conversation for a couple of years with Ohio State, um, and we're both very interested in seeing um, everything that the American Antiquarian Society can't use uh, go to Ohio State, because I think it's a, uh, it's a perfect facility. You know, through me, Bill uh, and Jim, have donated a significant amount of their work to the Cartoon Museum. In fact, Bill uh, has, uh, I think the Ohio State has 98 or 99% of all of the Calvin and Hobbes strips. So you've seen in the last couple of years, they come on the market occasionally and reach extraordinary prices. Um, there are, Bill estimates that there are probably only 20 or 30 original Calvin and Hobbes that are not at Ohio State. So um, maybe they deserve the crazy prices they're achieving. Um, they, soon that uh, little trickle of originals is going to uh, dry up. Uh, I guess I'm saying this because or reflecting on it because Bill and I have exchanged something like, I don't know, three or 400 letters over the last 50 years. And I intend, to Bill's great chagrin, I intend to donate them to Ohio State. He's um, more of a mind that uh, his private life is nobody's business, as you can imagine, the way he's lived it uh, for the last 40 years. But, um, as a historian, I believe that um, his creative process, uh, his thinking about his creative process, his trials and tribulations and his uh, successes and the way he reacted to that deserves to be preserved. Um, and so uh, we talk about it occasionally. I know he's bitter about it, but I can't, I can't see any other way to do this but to preserve these things for the future. So uh, my, uh, th that correspondence uh, will join uh, Bill's work eventually, uh, maybe after he kills me or, uh, you know, uh, I don't know how it will be resolved. Um, and my work, I've vowed to my wife that this house full of stuff is going to fi find a proper home before it's too late. Um, so that, yes, uh, the answer to your uh, short question and my long answer is that I 
believe emphatically in preserving the record and I'm uh, trying to do that as much as possible. And thank you for your good work in that area. Um, I know what an important role you've played. Uh, well, and I try to, but uh, yeah, I'm printing out my email from Bill too, and he'll get that too, <laughs> much to his annoyance, I'm sure. Uh, my second question, if we have time, um, Ben. Yeah, sure. Do sure. you know if uh, any of the um, cartoonists you have written about, Rich, were doing chalk talks? Uh, Mike Dooley says he knows of somebody who started in 1900, J. Stuart Blackton, but um, was anybody doing them in America in the 19th century? Absolutely. Um, one of the great chalk talk artists was Frank Beard, who uh, started during the Civil War, but he worked for Judge in the 1880s. And uh, uh, he was, uh, he went to Chautauqua, the um, summer retreat, starting in 1877 or 78. And he would do chalk talks there every year. Um, Thomas Nast, uh, I think he first toured in 74. And it was a, uh, a uh, disaster for him uh, emotionally. He was nervous on stage. But uh, he was doing a chalk talk. Uh, he did a tour, a lecture tour. Then in uh, 87, 88, uh, he embarked on a nationwide tour uh, to try and recover some of the money that he had lost in the uh, collapse of some investments he had made in the early 80s. I have, uh, I'm looking at a six and a half foot poster that Nass drew of him drawing himself that uh, announces uh, his lecture tour. Uh, and I have a large photograph of him on the stage surrounded by his Chalk Talk drawings from Portland, Oregon. Uh, so there's well-documented history of that form of entertainment. Then there were a lot of lesser cartoonists, people that we, that you and I wouldn't otherwise know. Uh, who did it for a living. Um, they would go to these small towns and entertain people, you know, for a dime or a quarter. Um, and they, like I said, they made that as their living. Uh, they were uh, professional performers. Um, and I don't know if their work appeared anywhere except on the stage. But I also have some record of uh, those guys too. So if uh, your friend wants to contact me, I'd be happy to supply him with photographs and uh, any images that he might like. Okay. Anybody else? Uh... Okay, thank you. That was great. That was fascinating. And uh, we'll, uh, if there are no other questions or comments, we can see everyone. Wait, uh, see everyone next week. Uh, so thank you. And have a great evening. Good night, everybody.